All right, welcome. Thank you for coming to this breakout session entitled How One Biblical Annihilationist Became a Biblical Universalist, which will be presented by Peter Hyatt. Peter graduated from Fuller in 1988, was ordained in the PCUSA, and worked at Bel Air Presbyterian and Community Presbyterian in Danville. I assume that's Danville, California. Mm -hmm. In 1992, he moved back to Colorado, pastored an evangelical Presbyterian church that grew from about 70 folks to a few thousand. Philip Yancey, a former congregant of Peter's, has called this presenter one of the best teachers I have ever had. Peter is a pastor at the Sanctuary Downtown in Denver, Colorado, and author of several books, including Eternity Now, which I believe is a, there's a book table as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here they are somewhere here. Mm -hmm. We'll have 45 minutes or so to hear his presentation, followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Let's welcome Peter as he comes to share with us. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's pray. Can we pray? Father, thank you for revealing yourself in Jesus, and I pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself now. It feels weird for me to be back at my old school talking to people. Um, Lord, I pray that you would talk to us, talk to our hearts. Wherever we're wrong, would you correct us? And uh, Lord, I think we can begin to pray that because we're beginning to see that you're good. Help us to see you as you truly are. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. Amen. So hopefully on each table there's a paper. I kind of prepared a paper for this whole thing, which is long, but I didn't want to just read that. So I pulled together some notes about what I pretty much wanted to say. And then I thought, hey, I could just type up these notes and hand them to you. So there's a, a single paper that I kind of want to walk through in a minute. First, I want to tell you a little bit of my story, which Dan said a little bit about already. Now, I went to school here at Fuller and was in the Peace USA and then in the EPC out in uh, Colorado where I was a pastor for 15 uh, years. Um, when I was here at Fuller, I read The Fire That Consumes by Fudge, and that book was really liberating for me, and I became something of a closet annihilationist. That was like kind of an accepted deviancy in my denomination. But over 20 years of preaching and having authored a couple books, uh, most, most notably probably at the start, the one on Revelation, I kept stumbling into what I call the Bible versus banned by Bible believing believers, the BBBBBBBs. And of course, they aren't really banned, but it's frowned upon reading those verses without then explaining them away. And I list some of those in the longer paper. I don't think they contradict annihilation but they promise ultimate reconciliation and restoration. So partly due to Fudge's paradigm, particularly the idea that eternal punishment does not equal endless conscious torment, uh, partly due to that, partly because of modern physics, partly because of some outrageous spiritual experiences I probably can, can't even really begin to talk about here, and then because of exegetical insights that um, we'll talk about a little bit, I gradually lost my ability to explain away the Bible versus banned by Bible believing believers. And then I got a little bit terrified as to why I would ever want to explain them away. And so I don't want to put that on anybody, but that was a real, that was a real deep question for me as a pastor. Why are these verses so incredibly disturbing for some? Maybe not for anyone, for everyone. But anyway, I just started preaching those verses in sermons. And so I didn't want to preach into a position, but I just made a decision after working through the Revelation, particularly getting to chapter 21, where the voice from the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. I just made a decision. I'm just going to start reading these verses and not explaining them away. And I did that for years and years, and people seemed to be fairly excited about it. And as I asked the question, does this fit into a systematic whole? Well, uh, about eight years ago, some people got nervous about that, went to my denomination, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. They couldn't figure out where I was being unbiblical, and so they made me state my exceptions to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Our denomination had been conscriptionist, and you know the confession disagrees with itself. So you're just toast at this point. <laughs> and um, there were two exceptions they didn't uh, approve. One, as I said, I have a hard time saying there's a group of people that cannot be saved because Jesus said with man it's impossible but with God all things are possible so how can I say that? They didn't approve that one. The other one was that I had to publicly confess that it pleased God to damn the rest of mankind. And I said I just don't know how to say 
I, when Scripture says he takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked, well, they were trying to get at this thing that we're talking about now and didn't know how. Well, the experience forced me to re-examine some of the things that we've said about hell and also about God's will to save and God's power to save. Uh, in, in other words, Yeshua, uh, Yeh Yehoshua, um, which, you know, is Jesus' name, which means God is uh, salvation. Well, I was publicly tried and defrocked. And <laughs> I still, I'm just so grateful that boiling people in oil was illegal in Colorado at the time <laughs> because I would be dead now, I'm convinced. But um, we, and several people, I, I had really hoped that the whole denomination would be willing to wrestle with these things, but, but they weren't. So lots of people in our church left, and we went about 20 miles to downtown Denver and started another church that's now an independent church. Uh, ben is here with me and Chris, they're from our church and Ben produces some of the short films that I, I want to show you here in a minute. But as a church we feel called to simply preaching the gospel from the perspective that Jesus wins. He, he always wins, even when he loses, especially when he loses, he wins. And over time, I've come to realize that I'm operating in a new paradigm, one that I haven't encountered in a whole lot of uh, debates. I'd say the closest, uh, what Robin said this morning, I thought was, it was the only time I've ever heard someone speak that long on hell and not disagreed with something they said. So I was really, I was just really blessed by that. So as near as I can tell, the paradigm that I'm operating from, I think the closest thing to it in terms of systematic theology is Karl Barth. So if you want to cut to the chase, I'm simply a four-point Calvinist is what I think I am. But there, but there are some paradigm, things in the paradigm shift that have allowed me to look at Scripture in a way that makes all of this work. But the shift allows me to affirm that God is love, uh, absolutely. God is almighty, absolutely. And yet I have to drop the idea that God would endlessly torment creatures that he had made. And over time, I began to realize I don't know that he could endlessly annihilate uh, creatures that he's made either. That, so, but we can, we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, when a paradigm shifts, you know, uh, everything remains the same, and yet the meaning changes. So you have that picture. There's a picture that I love to point to. But you're all, you all know, know this picture, right? I mean, and, and if, if someone doesn't see the showgirl and you see the old woman and you start arguing with them, it's really frustrating because a bunch of things have to change at once and all of a sudden the picture pops and, and it all makes sense. So a paradigm shift is incredibly complicated. The vision at the end of the shift is extremely simple. And I think um, my paradigm shifted from something that was more complex and more simple but the shift is, is uh, complicated. So I just want to talk about components to my paradigm shift. And that's what this short paper is about, because I thought, well, I can outline these steps. The first thing is the idea that when we talk about hell, we don't seem to know what we're talking about. And it's interesting that we had uh, Logos Bible software really got me fired because uh, when I got in trouble I really started investigating what the heck do we mean by the word hell and uh, the idea of three hells is really important to me and we put together this uh, short movie so I want to show this keep talking show one more movie then we'll discuss okay My daughter Becky was little. She was a Little Mermaid fanatic. I have this memory burned in my brain. Becky's standing in front of the TV. Ariel, the Little Mermaid, has lost her voice to the sea witch in an effort to make herself human. She's about to be imprisoned in the depths of the sea. All hell is breaking loose. But she gets her voice back and starts singing. At that point, I remember Becky standing in front of the TV yelling. Keep singing, Ariel! Keep singing! 
How do you sing about heaven when you feel like hell? Sometimes that seems to be a rather pertinent question for me. You know, King David seemed to think that he had spent some time in hell. Read Psalm 16, 18, 86, 139. Read it in the King James and you'll see what I mean. In Psalm 6, from the Hebrew, he writes, In death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, that is hell, who will give you praise? Good question. In Psalm 22, he seems to think that he's in hell. I, I wonder where that was. You know, at one point, David loved well, but lost everything and hid in a cave, buried by betrayal and rejection. It was like he did everything right, but suffered as if he had done everything wrong. He must have felt forsaken by family, friends, God himself. Maybe it was then. Later, he used his power to commit adultery and murder the woman's husband. He was the political and spiritual king of Israel and yet a slave to his own desires. Maybe it was then. Toward the end of his life, he found himself abandoned by his own son who murdered his other son, stole his throne and raped his wives. Now that is a dysfunctional family and we all know a little bit about that. I wonder where David was when he wrote Psalm 22. Verse one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you know that the Psalms are songs? The Psalms formed the songbook of ancient Israel and David must have sung some of them in hell. How do you sing about heaven when you feel like hell? Do you believe in hell? No, of course you don't. You may believe that there is a hell, but no one believes in hell. That's what makes it hell. Not believing is hell. Believing is faith. And faith means trust. To trust no one is to be utterly, entirely alone. That's hell. No one believes in hell. Except, of course, for one man. He is the song in hell. And I'm not talking about David. And when I say hell, of course, I'm talking about hell number one. In scripture, there are at least three different realities that we often refer to with the one English word, hell. The Bible uses the Hebrew word sheol and the Greek word Hades uh, to describe hell number one. It's outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. It's pictured as being in the abyss of the sea, the depths of the earth. It's in this world. It begins on the surface of the earth and continues after the body dies. It's the grave, the realm of the dead and the demonic. And in Sheol, no, no one sings. All feel forsaken. Hell number two is not the same as that but just the opposite of that. It's not the experience of God's absence, but the manifestation of God's presence. And who is God? Well, scripture tells us that our God is a consuming fire. He's not part fire and part love. He's all love and all consuming fire. Sodom was destroyed with that fire and the disciples were filled with that same fire on Pentecost. And check this out. Hell number one cannot be the same as hell number two. For in Revelation 20, hell number one is thrown into hell number two. Hades is thrown into the lake of fire and death shall be no more. The Bible never calls the lake of fire hell, but we think of it as hell. And that's too bad for I think a better name for it might be heaven or at least the substance of heaven which destroys the work of the devil in other words divinity theon in greek translated brimstone or divinity it, it's light that destroys the dark it's life that is the very death of death it's truth that destroys the lies it's logos that consumes chaos it's faithfulness that consumes faithlessness hope that destroys hopelessness love that fills all things in heaven no one feels forsaken 
everyone sings. And oh yeah, by the way, it's eternal. Eternal fire devours temporal hell. There's one last word or idea that gets translated as hell. That's Gehenna. It's a place, and I've been there. Ironically, they were having a barbecue, but there were no cries of pain and agony, just folks playing volleyball and eating chicken. Gehenna is the valley just to the south and the west of Jerusalem. In Jesus' day, it was a picture of judgment, a place where corruption and death were consumed by fire. Hell number three is the judgment of God. It's the place where light, life, love, consume darkness, death, and isolation. It's the burning boundary between time and eternity, between this fallen creation and the new creation, between the old man-made Jerusalem and the eternal Jerusalem. Did you know that Ariel is a biblical name for Jerusalem, and God's people are referred to as Jerusalem. Well, 2,000 years ago, Ariel had completely lost her voice, and the word of God, judgment of God, Jesus the Christ hung nailed to a tree just outside her city walls, where he bore the sin of the world, destroyed the work of the devil, and cried, it is finished. So Ariel, how do you sing about heaven when you feel like hell. Ask Jesus. There on the cross, he bore our griefs, carried our iniquities. He entered my hell and your hell. Uh, according to scripture, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, Ephesians 4, 9, where he preached to the spirits in prison, 1 Peter 3, 19. He preached to the dead, 1 Peter 4, 6. Or maybe he sang to them. In Jesus' day, there were no numbers on the Psalms. So to reference a Psalm or a song, you'd quote the first verse. On the cross, Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was Psalm 22. We know that Jesus started to sing it on the cross. I think he must have kept singing it in hell. And this is how it goes. Verse one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, from the words of my groaning? Verse 16, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. You know, he felt forsaken, but he sang that he was not forsaken. Listen, verse 24. He has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but is heard when he cried to him. From you comes my song of Hallel, my hallelujah. Now the end of the song. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. All who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive posterity shall serve him. It shall be told to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. It is finished. See, I think Jesus descended into hell singing and finished the song on the cross. Then he bowed his head, delivered up his spirit, his breath, his voice, that is the spirit that descends on Ariel upon Jerusalem as tongues of fire on Pentecost. It's the spirit that descended on David as he composed his songs in darkness. It's the spirit that causes you to call out to God saying, Abba, Father, it's the hallelujah. At the end of time, hell is cast into heaven and death is no more. At the cross, 
heaven is cast into hell and the king of heaven won't stop singing. Whatever will not move to the resonant frequencies of heaven is shattered by the sound of praise. And so the Israelites sang and the walls came tumbling down. Paul and Silas sang in prison and the earth shook and the doors flew open. Jonah sang to God in the belly of the beast in the depths of the sea. And, and by the way, the Bible calls that Sheol. He sang and the beast could not stomach the song. Jesus sang hallelujah in hell and shattered the gates of hell from the inside out. The song breaks the power of hell and each of us will get to see it happen. It's at the edge of hell where Christ is crucified where sin is consumed by the grace of God, the edge of hell and heaven, it's there that we meet the singer and learn his song. Music is based on a seven chord scale, like the seven days of creation. In a major chord, we hear perfect harmony, but in a minor chord, one note is one half step off. The minor chord makes us long for the major chord, for harmony, for completion. The fall on, on the sixth day makes us long for the completion of the seventh day. Well, at the minor fall, David didn't stop singing because Jesus didn't stop singing in David. David played the chord. He surrendered the discord. He surrendered his pain, shame, sin, and sorrow. And Jesus gave him the words. David sang, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus met him there and finished the song, singing discord into harmony, turning sin into grace and forsakenness into faith. David couldn't write that song or finish that song, but the song finished David, a baffled king composing hallelujah. Jesus descends into every hell in which the children of Adam find themselves. And there he sings and causes them to sing. Jesus was singing his song in my daughter Becky watching The Little Mermaid. There's a reason for the darkness and the cave. It's there we learn to sing the song. It's there we meet Jesus. Jesus is the rhythm, the reason, and the meaning of the song. He is the logos. He is the song. Jesus is the word God speaks to create all things and make you in his own image. And when I see it and, and believe it, I don't feel like I have to sing. I want to sing. And that's called faith. Even if it feels like hell, don't stop singing, Ariel.
So that's the first component, the, the three hells. And for me, that was big, seeing that, defining what we mean by hell. The second thing uh, that I think is really critical is your understanding of time and eternity. And this is a con oh, I got to turn the lights back on. This is a conversation that I haven't heard many people have. But I think it's fascinating that uh, the biblical and the postmodern view of space and time is that time is relative somehow to light, and God is light. And that space is relative somehow to meaning, and Jesus is the Logos. He is the meaning. So, um, scientists now say they know this. It's not even a theory. It's something that's been tested. They obviously can't know the, the final point of the theory, but according to Einstein, that uh, when you move at the speed of light, all time is eternally present to you in an eternal now, and God is light, and Jesus is the light of the world. You know, Scripture refers to this age, or the ages, um, ion in Greek, and it also refers to ionios, and this is where I'm different probably than some that say they're in the same camp, but I think age uh, is time as we know it, and ionios is God's time or, or eternity. So this age is temporal, and God's age is e eternal. And, and what I mean by this is that we all live in linear time. So there's a, there's a beginning. Now, that's a pretty big deal for science, too, with a big bang. And then you experience time in a straight line, which is interesting because we all dream about not experiencing time in the straight line because we go to Back to the Future movies and claim to and argue about them, right? So that's how we experience time. And usually when we talk about eternity, people kind of mean the time just keeps going forever and ever and ever. But the biblical view is that time has a beginning and an end. And you remember the name for the beginning and the end, right? It's Jesus. God is salvation. So Jesus is the beginning and the end of time. Jesus is the Logos. He's the plot of time. He's the, he's the story. And Jesus means God is salvation. Now, God, he's not even on the timeline. He is, I am, perfect in the perfect present. I am that I am. And you know, Scripture is just full of all these wild verses that I think modernistic people say, well, that's just a metaphor. And I think, no, I, I don't think that's a, that's a metaphor. That's, that's just the truth of who God is. But I, but I hope you see what this means. Because if you're a traditionalist, for my traditionalist friends, it means, well, well you have to ask the question about the three hells now. Where are they? Where, where's Hades on this, in this paradigm of space and time and eternity? Where's Gehenna? And wh where's this, this fire that is God, the consuming fire um, that is God. Well, if you're a traditionalist and you're struggling with verses about people um, suffering forever or things that happen forever, you see forever is on the line and forever has an end. So people can be suffering for all time and yet somehow be restored in eternity or have been restored in eternity. I mean, Paul says these crazy things like, um, or Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Paul says, we're already seated in the heavenly places. So if you're a traditionalist, um, well, that's kind of fascinating. Because I can, I can say, well, yeah, I think it's possible that someone might uh, suffer for all of time. But that doesn't mean that God can't restore them or he won't make them new. Uh, if, you're, if you're a conditionalist, I think it also uh, means something. And that is that things can be annihilated in time and then, boom, show up in eternity. So annihilation is not the death of recreation. And in Scripture, things annihilated in time show up later or are present always in eternity. That was something that really baffled me when I first began to see it. And probably the most amazing, I think, chapter is Ezekiel 16. Because at the end of Ezekiel, um, God says that He's going to restore Jerusalem, Samaria, and Sodom. And, you know, Sodom's destroyed by eternal fire. And you read Isaiah and Jeremiah, Jerusalem gets, like, beat up way more than even Sodom. And you know, in the Revelation, Jerusalem comes down new from heaven, and um, uh, it's made of people. So it's constructed with people. And like in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus even says, um, Blessed are uh, the poor, of them consists the kingdom of heaven. That would be a more literal translation. And the Jerusalem above, according to Paul, is our mother. So what happens? Jerusalem shows up on the timeline, gets destroyed, 
and then it comes down from heaven. Supposedly the same thing happens to Sodom, happens to Samaria, which you know is Israel. Um, so things destroyed in time can show up in eternity. I think one of the most fascinating verses of all is Isaiah 66, where it talks about the consuming fire and, and the worm. And you know, if you take, this is what I've found, if you take Bible, the Bible, for lack of a better word, literally, more literally, it sets you free. Because Isaiah 66, at the end, is the most scary stuff I had ever read. You know, corpses being consumed by eternal fire, the worm that will not die. But if you take it literally, all flesh comes out of the New Jerusalem and looks down in the Valley of Gehenna and sees all the, of those that have rebelled against him. This is where Logos Bible software gets me in trouble, because I look up the Greek word, or the Hebrew word for rebel, where it shows up in Isaiah, and you'll see that the people that have rebelled against him is everyone including the Messiah. So all people come out of the New Jerusalem and look at all corpses in the Valley of Gehenna being consumed by the, the eternal fire and the worm that won't die because it eats death itself. And that's a fascinating story we don't have time for. But anyway, that pattern shows up over and over in Scripture. Zephaniah 3, 8 through 9 is a great one. All the earth shall be consumed that all the people may call upon his name. Um, Paul's a great example. Um, when, he, when he writes, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Well, what happened to the old Paul? Well, I think he got annihilated. And scripture says, uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. That's going to happen to all of us. Well, we're made from dust. So we're, getting, we're made and reduced to our com constituent parts and then uh, remade again. So the point is, in scripture, everything that's anything is annihilated in time and forever new in eternity. Th that was a, a big point for me. And that leads to number three, because you asked the question, what about evil? And I'm so glad that Robin touched on this, because I haven't heard people talk about it. But I really think, according to scripture, evil is an absence. And people have a hard time understanding that. Let's see if this will work. But you can kind of see that. Do you see that? Do you see the shadow right there? Do you see that shadow? Because no, you don't. <laughs> it's not there. When we say, I see a shadow, what are we saying? We're saying, I see the absence of light. And when we say, I see evil, we're seeing the absence of good. Some people stress when I talk about that, but I've had so many bizarre encounters with demonic spirits, and we had a friend that was raised in a coven, that um, I'm not saying that evil isn't our enemy. Like a shadow can really kill you. Um, I I'm saying that uh, evil is the real presence of an absence. And in the end, uh, goodness is God's substance. So goodness is God, and, and God is love, and evil is the absence. So evil is destroyed in a sea of grace, or this empty world is filled with God. And that's what I referenced in there. But when you think about it, life annihilates death, light annihilates dark, truth annihilates lies, the way annihilates lostness, which is apolumi, also translated destroyed. Logos annihilates chaos. I am annihilates I am not. Love fully fills the law, which means that the law was empty. New man, eternal life, destroys and fills the old man. Eternity fills temporality. God in Christ Jesus will fill all things. In other words, the something annihilates the nothing. So when you start talking about annihilation and recreation, the vocabulary gets really difficult. Because I, I would say, well, am I an annihilationist? Yeah, I'm an annihilationist because I'm a restorationist or whatever you want to use. The word universalism bothers me because the way it's been used by certain people. But anyway, so that's three of them. The fourth one, a big one for me, I'm moving through these quick so we can watch one more film, is that the idea that God is one, the Shema that we prayed last night. So God is love and God is a consuming fire. I think that means love is a consuming fire. So God's not part love and part something else that we have called justice. So God is one and we are two. Do you have that other slide, Ben? Um, we, are, we are two. We have an old man that we think we create with our judgments. I think that was the temptation of the evil one in the garden. Uh, Eve, take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I think is the law, and make yourself in the image of God. So what does Eve make and then that first Adam make? 
Well, they make a false self, a, a disobedient self, a, a full of darkness, lies, death, and empty. They make the old Adam. But I also have a new me, the new Adam. That's the me that God creates through God's judgment, which is grace. And it's mercy, light, truth, life. It's full. It, the, the new man takes the place of the old man. So it's kind of fascinating because that means the old man really wasn't wasted. The old man becomes the place for the revelation of the new man. So where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Sin increased in Adam. The new man fills the void that's the old man. The old Adam, I think, is what Jesus called the son of the devil. Um, because remember, he said that to the Pharisees. You're of your father, the devil. And he said, he's the father of what? <laughs> lies. Not people. Lies. The new Adam is somehow the eschatos Adam. That's uh, Christ himself. I mean, it's almost as if he actually meant it when he said, you're my body. Uh, amazing stuff. Anyway, number six I have down is God's judgment. Um, realizing God's judgment is God's decision. God's judgment is to create Adam in his own image. Jesus is God's judgment, and just the name Jesus is a judgment. Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation, God's decision to save. So God's judgment annihilates the old man and creates the new. Annihilates the work of the devil and creates the work of God. Annihilates bad decisions and reveals God's good decision, which is grace. We're annihilated and created at the cross. We die with Him and rise with Him. So a believer is someone that dies before they die. An unbeliever is someone that uh, still needs to die after he dies, or she dies. And, and I think that's what Scripture is talking about with, with the second death. Well, number six, God's judgment is grace. And Scripture talks as if there is one multifaceted judgment. And this is, if any of you want to talk more about this in terms of the details of the Scripture, I'd love to do it because I've preached through all this stuff. But I think... The judgment of the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, the great white throne judgment, they're all one judgment. And the judgment is Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction that comes from, that's the Greek, the translator changed it, comes from the presence of the Lord. So in other words, the picture is, the judgment is this. Jesus just goes, boom, here I am. And evil is like uh, devoured. And I think Paul suffered that judgment on the road to Damascus. So, he, so that's why he, he, would, he would write what he did. It's no longer I who live. John 3.19, this is the judgment, the judgment singular. The light has come into the world. People of darkness rather than the light. Now is the judgment of this world. And I will draw all people to myself. Number seven, I hope this isn't too much, but I know we don't have much time, is, is justice. Robin touched on that this, this morning as well. Uh, this helps me. Uh, rather, the big words like retributive justice, all that stuff I've forgotten since sem seminary. But I like to say, justice is not people getting what they deserve. I mean, that's an illogical statement if, if you're a believer. Because how could people deserve anything? We're created from God and nothing. So justice cannot be people getting what they deserve. Justice is God getting what God deserves. And what does God deserve? He deserves people made in His image that love in freedom. So all righteousness, I was thinking about this the other day too. I go, some of our arguments are, are to me, seem so strange now when I think about it. But all righteousness is imputed righteousness. The idea that I could have some kind of righteousness that's not imputed, I think, is original sin. So number seven, justice is God getting what God deserves. Number eight, we're justified by faith. We're made right by faith, imputed to us through grace. Faith completes us in the image of God. So number eight is that God creates faith with his judgment of grace, Jesus Christ. In other words, because we started to have this discussion today, and I oh man, I wish I could jump in. But um, what I'm saying is that Jesus is um, our responsibility. I am not responsible without Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus is the one that makes me responsible, and I think the word for that is faith. So the cross is not a test of our faith. 
The cross creates our faith and annihilates our lack of faith, our sin. So you see, I, I think I'm, even though I don't like this term, you can call me that, I think I'm a universalist because I don't think traditionalism or mere conditionalism takes sin seriously enough. And I don't think they take judgment seriously enough or the work of Christ on the cross seriously enough. The cross is the revelation of God's judgment. God's judgment is love. The word of love creates all things, including your faith, which is a good free will. We argue and argue about free will, and I go, well, when we don't know what we mean, but I'm going, well, what if you're predestined to love God in freedom? <laughs> I think that's what scripture is saying. You're predestined to have a free will. If you think that you create yourself, you think you can create your own free will, but I, I think scripture is saying your will is in bondage. A good free will is the creation of God through the judgment of God, which is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So all people, I believe, are predestined for a good free will. And that's number nine, this one little film that I want to show you. I think we've lost the, the big story. We've lost the big story fixated on what man can do and not on what God does do. Um, the, the, the big picture, I think, is that God is making us in His image with His Word. And here's the Gospel. His Word does not return void. He does not fail. So. Hey kids, guess what? We're going to the Magic Kingdom! Yes! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> Woo! No! Maybe I better go back to the beginning and explain. When my children were little, they had a dream. A dream called the Magic Kingdom. It was a whole new world full of wonder where everything was very good. Well, one year, some friends offered us a week at due to copyright protection at a certain well-known theme park in Orlando, Florida. All we had to do was get there. We couldn't afford to fly, but I figured we could drive. We had a minivan. I came up with the idea of surprising the kids because I knew that if we told them too early they'd drive us crazy and I cherished that moment of revelation when I'd say, we're going to the Magic Kingdom and you know their faces would light up with joy and they'd begin to dance spontaneously with unspeakable gratitude for me. Well anyway, as vacation time approached, they began to press for information and well we didn't want to lie so I got out a map and I charted out the journey. I realized that we'd be traveling through a place called Junction City, Kansas, the place where I was born. So when they were pressing one day, where are we going, Daddy, where are we going? I said, Kansas. We're, we're going to Kansas. And, and they said, wow, what's in Kansas? And I said, oh, there's stuff in Kansas. Motels, swimming pools, great stuff. So my kids began putting their hope in Junction City, Kansas. Well, the day finally came. We left the house early in the morning and set up for Kansas. If you subtract four hours of potty breaks, it's about a six hour drive from Denver to Junction City. Then one hour further on to Kansas City where we'd rest, get a hotel, and then be on our way to the Magic Kingdom. It was a long van ride for the kids. So when we exited I-70 for Junction City, the kids were pretty excited. John was looking for motels or swimming pools. The kids were talking about how they're gonna see the place where daddy was when he was a little boy. We drove past this dilapidated old bowling alley and they all yelled out, Daddy, we can go bowling, can we go bowling? Daddy, can we go bowling? And I said, maybe. We drove to the church that my dad had pastored when I was a little boy. I, I called ahead and now the pastor was waiting for us. 
he showed us around the old building. The kids had these disposable cameras, the kind with film, and they were all taking pictures. I said, you, you might want to save some of those pictures for later. He said, what for? I said, well, stop, stop. We're going to see more stuff. Just trust me. After that, we all sat down. Susan had gone to the van to get the secret bag of Magic Kingdom accessories, hats, etc., etc. Then I started the prearranged dialogue with the pastor. I said, so pastor, what is there to do here in Junction City? He said, we got a great lake. You go down and walk around the lake. And I said, well, you know, we've got a lake in, in Denver. He said, well, we, we got a bowling alley. And the kids said, yeah, yeah, dad, bowling. We could go bowling. And, and then he said, and we got a miniature golf course. And I said, well, you know, we already have a lake. We got bowling alleys and a miniature golf course in Denver, Colorado. You know, we've already seen the church and the house. It seems like there's nothing left to do here in Junction City. Maybe we ought to just go. The kids said, Dad, what do you mean? Come on, Dad, what do you mean? And then I said, so, Pastor, if we went back out to the exit and got back on I-70 and just kept going, where would we end up? And the pastor said, hmm, if you went back out to the exit and, and just kept going, well, I guess you'd end up in, like, Florida. And I looked at the kids and I said, Florida? What's in Florida? Elizabeth said, um, um, that well-known theme park in Orlando? And I said, kids, we're going to the Magic Kingdom! Well, you know how this part goes. It was the most anticlimactic moment of my entire life. Totally frustrated, I finally just said, get in the van, just get in the van! I was thinking, man, they are getting a tongue lashing once we're all in the van. You are the most ungrateful, disrespectful, spoiled children. Do you have any idea how much this cost me? And Coleman said, well, I wanted to go to the park. And then I had this thought, almost as if God was talking to me. He said, hey, Peter, did you know that this is just what it's like to be your daddy? You see, it's not that my children's hopes were too big. They had actually become far too small. Their desires not too strong, but too weak. And don't get me wrong, Junction City would have been fun for a time. But after three weeks of sitting in front of the Tasty Freeze, walking up and down the aisles of the Walmart like zombies while the kids moaned, Dad, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. Junction City would have turned into hell. But you understand, Junction City was in the grasp. It was under their control. The Magic Kingdom, that was just a painful van ride away. It must have looked like death. Get in the van. It must have sounded like pick up a cross and come follow. Well, you know, we have a father in heaven and the Bible is full of journeys and children confused and complaining on those journeys. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Israel, and us. We're on a journey. Do you ever wonder, what's the point of the journey? God doesn't have to drive, he can fly. What's the point of this journey called life and our stop in this junction city of a world? Just like I mapped out our route from Denver to Junction City and on to the Magic Kingdom, I think our father mapped out our route from beginning to now and on to the end. I think he even told us the route. In the beginning is the start of Genesis chapter 1. Then we read about six days of creation, kind of like six hours of driving. Toward the end of the sixth day, man is made in God's image. And at the end of six hours of driving, we came to a junction. Junction city. On the seventh day, God rests. And I knew that if we didn't get stuck in Junction City, but could just get to Kansas City, our hotel, a good night's rest, well, we'd be, we'd be good for the magic kingdom. You know, on the seventh day of creation, according to scripture, everything is finished. Everything is good. 
And in Genesis, the prophets, the revelation, that seventh day appears to be eternal. It's very, very, very big. Maybe bigger than all of space and time. Well, anyway, on the sixth day, God makes Adam. The name means man or mankind. And on the seventh day, everything, everything, everything is very good. It is finished. So here's a question. Where are we on this journey? Well, are you finished? Is everything very good? Has God finished making mankind? You know, the Bible describes the seventh day when all has been made and then goes back and describes how God makes man. That's the sixth day. You see, most folks think that the perfect seventh day came and went thousands or millions of years ago. They think everything was perfect until Adam and Eve mess it all up. But if everything had been perfectly good before Adam and Eve messed it all up, why was there a wall around the garden before they messed it all up? How do you explain that evil talking snake and those two naked people dumb enough and incomplete enough to listen to that evil talking snake? You know, they didn't have knowledge of the good. And so couldn't have faith in the one who is good. And surely that's not good. Everything was not yet good in that garden. And man was not yet finished in the image of God. So when is God's seventh day of rest? And when is Adam finally finished in the image of God? You know, if you take your cues from the meaning of the text, rather than our antiquated modern notions of time, it seems pretty clear that Genesis chapter 1 is like the history of all time. And for most of us, well, we still live in the sixth day, the sixth day of creation. A few years ago, physicist Gerald Schroeder wrote a few books pointing out that according to Einstein's theories of relativity, the age of the universe is entirely dependent on the standpoint of the observer. And remember, there was no earth to stand on in the beginning. Schroeder calculates that if the creation is about 15 billion years old from the standpoint of the earth, it must be about six or seven days old from the standpoint of the Big Bang, or at least the moment light is first emitted just after the Big Bang. Whether or not he got the physics exactly right, it's clear that arguing about the age of the earth, old or young, is, is just silly. And even more importantly, not metaphorically, but actually and scientifically, we could be living in the sixth day of creation on the edge of an eternal seventh day. The seventh day doesn't start until Jesus, the perfect image of God, hangs on a tree in a garden on the sixth day of creation, on the sixth day of the week, at the sixth hour, and cries, it is finished. It's at that tree that we are given eternal life seventh day life and that means the big story is not that God made everything good we messed it up and now he's trying to fix it with the whole Jesus thing the big story is that he's making us in his image with his word who is Jesus and he won't fail it means our father is taking us on a journey and we will all arrive at our destination but on the sixth day we all find ourselves at a junction. It's a place where we make a choice, or should I say the Father creates a choice in us. It's the place where His choice becomes our choice. And we choose to get in the van. Jesus is the van. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the Father's choice and surrendering our choice to his choice is called faith. You know, it just about killed my kids to get in the van, and yet they finally did get in the van. Maybe they saw that it killed me, that it was killing them. They knew that their pain was my pain, and so my pleasure was their pleasure. So they had just enough faith in me to get in the van. But what if they hadn't gotten in the van? Would I have left them forever in Junction City or consigned them to endless torment? No, because that wouldn't make me happy. Their pleasure is my pleasure. 
You know, I hate going to copyright protected theme parks without my kids. It's their happiness that makes the Magic Kingdom magic for me. Well, if they hadn't gotten in the van, I wouldn't have consigned them to endless torment. However, I might have granted their bad choice for a time. That my good choice might become their choice in time. Maybe that's why God made time. In other words, I might have said, fine, you can just stay in Junction City. But I would have stayed with them. I would have descended into that hell with them. Then after three weeks of sitting in front of the Dairy Queen and wandering around the Walmart like zombies, mumbling, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I would have said, now, let's get in the van. You know, until we got to Junction City, the Magic Kingdom was only my choice. But as I shut the van door, my choice became our choice. Granted, it was only the size of a mustard seed, but the seed grew and became a kingdom. And that's how we got the hell out of Junction City. So why stop in Junction City at all? Why does God allow this fallen world at all? I don't think I can fully answer that question, but I do know that stopping in Junction City made the magic kingdom that much more magic. Over and over again, it happened. We'd be standing in line for Space Mountain, or we'd be eating those giant turkey legs that they call alien legs. One of the kids would just stop me. Their eyes would get huge, and they'd just exclaim, Oh, Daddy, I can't believe that I wanted to stay in Junction City. I love you. It means I trust you. And that's called faith. You know, all sorts of folks visit copyright protected theme parks and have a hell of a time. I mean, it feels like hell because they don't have faith in love. You see, faith in love and God our Father is love. Faith in love is what makes the magic kingdom magic for us. And that means the magic really starts in the van. My kids are young adults now, and they love to reminisce about family vacations. And this is the crazy thing. They don't seem to miss any copyright protected world famous theme parks. You know what they miss? Our time in the van. In Jesus name, believe the gospel and get in the van. A little miniature golf place. Yeah. But we have a bowling alley at home. Yeah, you might as well go home to do that. Roller skating right here. We can roller skate at home too. Well, what else could we do? Let's get on the playground! No, we got playgrounds at home. We can play here. Hey, what's to the If we stayed on Interstate 70 and just kept driving, where would we go? Well, you. Keep on going far enough, you get to the other side of the United States, the east side. You can take, if you want to get even hotter, you can then take the interstates angling down. I don't know. I think go it's to Florida. Hot enough here. Hot enough here? Okay. How far is Florida? Oh, let's see, about 1,500 miles. 1,500. What do they have? What did that be like? What do they have in Florida? I don't know. You know anything that's in Florida? Alligators? Yeah. Uh, I wonder. Crocodiles, anything to do to play there? Um, Disney World? Yeah. Oh, hey, you want to go to Disney World? I'd rather be here. What? You'd rather be here? No. John, do you want to go to Disney World? No. I'll think about that one. Yeah. You think about it? Well, we'll stay here if you want, but... Okay. Yeah, I'm totally serious. We're driving two more days to Disney World. And then we're going to go to the beach. How many days are I'm going to follow... But I think I think that's what we've what we've uh, that's what we've missed the the big picture the big story of creation and so we I just pulled together this this book which is on that uh, the first chapter of Genesis and the idea that the first chapter of Genesis is really the index to all time so God gives us the plot from the very first chapter and then we start going through the story and we discover the plot is Jesus and he's the beginning and the end 
and God pulls it off. Um, for me, the journey w was a long one, wrestling through all the exegesis, and I mean, I'm still on it, uh, absolutely, but that's what is addressed a lot more in the paper. Um, I think it becomes amazingly simple, though, in the end, and that is that salvation is simply being okay with my own creation. Isn't that weird? Uh, because if God is the creator, and he creates out of nothing and himself, that means absolutely everything is grace. I'm grace. My trust is grace. So any illusion that I have created myself will be utterly annihilated in the manifest presence of God, like an, a snowdrop in, in fire, poof, gone. Um, but it's good. Because that illusion is the thing that keeps me imprisoned to shame and fear. And I, I think one of the saddest things for me is that believers do not have compassion for sinners. We're jealous of sinners. And that just shows that we are incredible sinners. <laughs> and so good news, God is an even, even better Savior. So anyway, um, questions about that? That went a little long, so you can shut us off when you we need to, Dan. Okay, so yeah, any, any, any questions? And you can grab me the rest of the conference. I'm yeah. share my ignorance. Uh, Paul is not a Calvinist, correct? Oh, I, I think he didn't know John Calvin, so it would be... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's my point. Uh, I guess what puzzles me is there's this huge emphasis on Calvinism. Can you explain sure. the foundation of that? Sure. I, I mean, I, I really think the thing Calvin latched on to, which was also in Augustine, that I think is really right and good, and that is that God is all-powerful. And so all glory goes to God. So if you are saved, all glory goes to Him, and no glory goes to you. The problem was, like Robin mentioned today, I think, and now you're getting into the psychology of people that lived in the past or whatever, is folks that well, dang, if that's the case, then how do you get people to hell? And, well, in that scheme, the only way to get people to hell is to say Jesus really didn't die for everyone. Or, I mean, maybe someone has some other ideas, but I don't know what, what they are. So, that's that. It's the middle point of Calvinism, which, <laughs> which I think should be taken away. And, and that is the idea that uh, the atonement was limited. I always struggled with that one because, I mean, I was a Presbyterian. So I'd go back and look at this. Yeah, see, there you go. That's my problem. I'd look at systematic theology books and I'd be like, why this limited atonement? And when I'd really follow the logic through, it's like, well, how else are we going to get people to hell? And I said, well, I don't know. That that's a great reason to believe in limited atonement, especially when the scriptures say something different. But then on the other hand, I didn't like the, the Arminian position. That just scared the poop out of me because that meant I'm responsible for everybody else's salvation, including my own. And when I take Jesus seriously, uh, I'm just toast. I mean, and everybody's toast if it's ultimately dependent on us. So, that's, you know, I think it, that's what's kind of hard about the conversation. People are coming out of different streams. But for me, this bigger paradigm makes the streams come together. And even that free will determinism stuff, I think, comes together in a beautiful way. And that, oh, we're all experiencing our own creation, and the thing that God is creating in us is a good free will. The, the, like Karl Barth says, the ability to choose the good in freedom, which is in the image of God.